let me begin again. It is a joy to be with you. Uh, and I do bring you greetings from my pastor, John MacArthur, and the elders of Grace Community Church. We, for many years, have heard of the faithful testimony of Christ Baptist Church. And what I mean by that is the testimony of you, the saints, in your love for Christ, your commitment to the authority of Scripture, your willingness to submit your lives to the lordship of, your, of Christ, and to pursue a life of obedience that's motiv motivated by a love for him. And then because of your testimony for Christ in this community and, and far-reaching even to neighboring nations. And so I do bring you greetings, but our gratitude for your faithfulness to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I do consider it truly my honor to be with you this morning, uh, knowing that this is a very special place where God is at work. Well, we have just participated in one of the most sacred reminders for believers, and that is the taking of the Lord's Supper. We do that in remembrance, don't we, of the work of Christ on our behalf, and we just sang about it, and our hearts are full as we reflect on who Christ is and what he has done for us. But Charlie reminded us, as he took us earlier today, to the text of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and in that context, Paul reminds us of all that Christ has done for us, and then he says what? We have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation. And then he goes on to say, we are his ambassadors. See, we've been rescued from a kingdom of darkness and now are citizens of heaven, but we are still God's ambassadors with a message of peace, bringing reconciliation between those who are still lost in the kingdom of darkness. This is a noble honor that is entrusted to us. And it reminds us that the gospel itself is not something that is to just be kept to ourselves or consumed for our own personal benefit, but that the gospel itself is a stewardship entrusted to us. And each of us who claim Christ as our Lord have that stewardship. Yes, it's in earthly vessels. We are weak. And we rely on him for the strength that is necessary to be a bold testimony and to be a bright light in the midst of a difficult and dark world. And it's God himself who grants us faith and courage to step out and to proclaim Christ to others. This is a noble calling to each of us. But it might be the case that sometimes in our preoccupation with our own duties and responsibilities of family and church life, that we find ourselves not as faithful or not as willing to participate in the work of evangelism and the gospel. And I want to begin by saying, as we look at the gospel stewardship this morning, that evangelism is not something that should ever be motivated out of guilt. And yet, oftentimes, that's exactly how believers are made to feel. We hear announcements to show up for evangelism outings and programs, and we know we should be there and participate, and we find excuses, and maybe we feel that we're not confident in the proclamation of the message of the gospel. What if they ask us difficult questions? What if I don't know how to answer those questions? Well, my encouragement to you is to be a student of the gospel. You have a beautiful testimony of how Christ has rescued you. And add to that testimony a few key verses that explain in simple ways exactly what Christ has done. But sometimes it's the preoccupation with just the good things of church duties and responsibilities that keep us occupied. And this morning I want to encourage you that... The message of the gospel, the stewardship of the gospel, is something that God himself will accomplish through us. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. I've entitled this sermon, A Gospel-Centered Prayer. And I share this text with you this morning because I want you to leave confident and bold that it is God who advances the gospel. We are simply his instruments and his means He'll provide the wisdom and, and the strength and the ability for us to be faithful. And we will do that where he has set us in our own homes. 
If you're a parent who's trying to raise children to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, if it's among your neighbors where you have occasion to encounter them in acts of kindness or service and you can reflect Christ and speak Christ to them, if it's participation intentionally in the community and activities and hobbies and, and ways that you can connect with believers, praying and looking for those opportunities to share Christ, God has uniquely set you in circumstances. He's placed you in special settings that are true of only you. And as you seek him and rely on him, he can use you to be such an ambassador that we're called to do. And you don't need to be anxious about that. But you do need to be expectant. And that's what this text tells us. How it is that God is going to guide us into open doors of ministry for the gospel. Now, the book of Colossians itself is a wonderful epistle that Paul writes. And let me just remind you, he authored this book while he was imprisoned in Rome. Now, Paul, earlier in his missionary travels, had spent three years in the city of Ephesus. And one of his disciples there was a man named Epaphras. And Epaphras carried the gospel to the city of Colossae. Paul had never been to Colossae. And early in the text of chapter 1, Paul tells us that even in prison, he has heard from Epaphras a wonderful testimony of how God has redeemed and is sanctifying the saints in Colossae. And he rejoices in that. And so he writes this epistle to to them as a, a pastor, to really his spiritual grandchildren. And he encourages them for the work God's doing among them. But what he begins to unfold in this wonderful letter is the supremacy of Christ. He wants to remind the Colossians that it is Christ who rules and reigns. It is Christ who will one day bring everything into subjection under his headship. It is Christ in whom every believer is being made complete and being perfected in him. And so Paul wants them to recognize the supremacy of Christ in all things. And as he exalts Christ in this text, throughout it, he addresses them what our responsibility as believers. Let me just rehearse for you so you have the context of the book of Colossians before we come to our text. In Colossians 1.1, he says to the saints, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects. In Colossians 1.17-18, he says, all things have been created by him and for him. And in verse 28 of chapter 1, he says, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man mature in Christ. In chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, following his example and his pattern. And in verse 13 of chapter 2, he says, He, Christ Jesus, made you alive together with him. Amen? And then in chapter 3, verse 3, he says, For your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 10 of that chapter, he says, And now have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And then in verse 17, he continues and says, And whatever you do, and you know this verse, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then in verse 18 of chapter 3 through Chapter 4, verse 1, he begins to focus then on what it looks like to live a life that reflects Christ in your human relationships. He speaks to wives and says, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And and ladies, just again, what a noble responsibility that you've been entrusted with. You have imperfect husbands. They're in the process of being made like Christ. Okay? Okay? And you're instructed to be subject to to your husbands because your opportunity is to give the church and the world a picture of what the body of Christ looks like when they submit to the Lord Jesus Christ who is perfect. And so you have a ministry of modeling what the church is to look like as the bride of Christ in submission to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Our world wants to strip you of that noble calling and redefine 
honoring your husbands as something that somehow causes you to be inferior in your role. Actually, if you study the scriptures, it's a dignified, it's a noble calling for women to do this. And you give a gift to the saints when you provide that example. Now, husbands, Paul goes on to say, if Christ is supreme in all things, then you are to love your wives how? Just as Christ then loves the church. And this wonderful picture that you afford the church and the world is what it means to lovingly pursue and sacrifice for your bride, just as Christ has done so for his bride. And then he speaks to children. Children, you are to obey your parents, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Even young children who are being raised in the admonition of the Lord and taught to obey their parents, it's not ultimately for their parents' good, but that they can illustrate and provide an example how we as the children of God are to pursue obedience in a way that shows our love to the Lord. And you children, you have the opportunity to demonstrate how believers are to show obedience, motivated out of a love and respect and honor for your parents, just as we do as children of God, obey him to show our love and honor to him. And then he speaks of slaves to masters and in our contemporary sense, employees to employers. And he says, work as for the Lord rather than for men. And he reminds us that you have the opportunity to go about your work in a way that approaches your work as, as man was created to work. It's dignified. It's what we were created to do. And yes, the fall corrupted that and gave us a, a set of motives that are different than what God intended for us in work. But as we sanctify our hearts, we can go about our work to put God on display with our diligence and our sacrifice and our integrity and our faithfulness so that we can be trustworthy and to show how work originally was intended for man to be a way to reflect and glorify God. And then he goes on to speak to masters or employers and says, now you have a responsibility as believing employers to demonstrate that we too have a master in heaven and you need to conduct yourself just as Christ the master conducts himself towards us. And so bringing everything under the lordship of Jesus Christ so that he is put on display and that he is honored. And Paul knows this is necessary then to be a faithful testimony for Christ. And so we come to our text and we want to read in Colossians chapter 4 verses 2 through 6. Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity, and let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now as we consider this text, we often think in terms of the tension sometimes in being a testimony for Christ as an ambassador and a witness for him. And in his classic work, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, J.I. Packer speaks to the great and necessary reality that man does not save himself, nor is he able to save another. While there is personal responsibility from the human perspective, it is impotent apart from the divine power at work in us. And we must be reminded that any gospel enterprise is not conducted successfully as far as eternal fruit unless God is at work opening the heart and opening the doors of opportunity. Paul, the greatest of missionaries, the apostle to the Gentiles, understood this truth fully. And we see this expressed in this call of a gospel-centered prayer. And the importance of prayer in advancement of the gospel is the testimony of the saints who've gone before us. Consider one famous missionary, Hudson Taylor, who served 
for many years as a missionary to China, he made this observation. He says, you can work without praying, but it is a bad plan. But you cannot pray in earnest without working. Do not be so busy with work for Christ that you have no strength left for praying. We should pause and consider the wisdom of the seasoned, sacrificial, faithful missionary. A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, said this, prayer is the mighty engine that is to move the missionary work. And so, yes, we must fulfill our role and responsibility in being the proclaimers of the good news. But may we not be guilty of presuming that we can, by our best intended human endeavors, bring anyone into the kingdom of God. And this is the great truth that Paul exhorts the Colossians to recognize. Because when you recognize it's God at work through us to advance the gospel, who receives the glory? And that's why the theme of the, uh, the supremacy of Christ in this text is now brought to a clear focus in our gospel ministry. He will receive the glory, not us. And so after all that Paul has conveyed about the supremacy of Christ, he now urges the Colossians to pray for four specific opportunities for Christ to be honored and the gospel advanced. And I trust that this text will serve you as a guide so that you can become stewards of the gospel message too, wherever he has set you and wherever he has planted you. Opportunity number one, gospel-centered prayer is an opportunity to delight in Christ. Gospel-centered prayer is an opportunity to delight in Christ, delight for what he has done for us. Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer. Now this is common to Paul. And as he writes so frequently about being devoted to prayer, we need to understand the meaning of the term, being devoted. It's a continued steadfastness in prayer. What he's saying is keep alert in it with an attitude. He goes on to add to that with thanksgiving. The idea is here is to be courageously persistent and to hold fast and to not let go. Now let me just say a word to you. Some of you are praying for an unbelieving child or an unbelieving spouse or an unbelieving friend or neighbor. Don't lose heart. Paul's saying be persistent, be devoted. God has all things arranged in his sovereign time and his purpose. And yes, in one regard, we don't know who the chosen are. He does. And as much as we long to see every person that we love come to know Jesus Christ, we have to rest in the assurance of God's sovereign purpose. And our work is a work of prayer. And so we're to be devoted. But maybe it's the case that you haven't been praying for the lost in your life, or you haven't considered the role of prayer in the work of evangelism. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to begin to participate in this. Make it the foundation of your ministry of evangelism. This is a common exhortation by Paul. He says in Ephesians 6, 18, to pray at all times, or in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, to pray without ceasing. He states it in Romans 12, 12, be devoted to prayer. Just being purposed. It doesn't tell us that on the hour you have to pray. He doesn't give us a legalistic standard to fall. What he's saying is a heart that's captivated with the needs of the lost is a heart that just continues to intercede on their behalf. If you really care about the lost, you carry that burden to the Lord. Don't hear from me a legalistic approach to prayer and evangelism. Certainly, you could put it in your schedule as a reminder we're human, we're limited, and we benefit from having a plan. But it's not the plan, it's the heart that drives you to prayer. And that's what we see in Paul. He has such a concern for the advance of the gospel and a love for God's people that, that it motivates him to prayer. When we think about persistence in prayer, we might be reminded of our Lord's example found in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 10. You remember the account of the widow who seeks protection from a judge and he doesn't respond to her request the first time 
or the second time, or likely the third time. We don't know how many times. But what Christ is pointing to is the persistence of the widow. There is a need, and there's one person who can meet that need, and she is not going to stop until she sees that need met. And that's the idea behind being devoted to prayer for the sake of the gospel. There's only one person who can meet the need of the lost. The only person who can open up their hearts to prepare them to receive the faith that he alone gives that they might respond to the message of the kingdom. There's only one person. And so you persist in prayer to the only one who can accomplish that end. Christ uses a second example of persistence in prayer in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And it's the story of a man who's awakened in the middle of the night by a guest who's been traveling. And of course, to meet their needs and practice hospitality, he desires to feed them, but he has no bread. And what does he do? He goes to his neighbor, who also is asleep, and he knocks on the door. And there is no response. And so he knocks on the door, and there is no response. And we don't know how many times he knocks on the door, but eventually he awakens his neighbor, and he compels him to help meet the need that only he can, need, can meet. He has no means, he has no ability to meet the needs that he faces, and so he relies on his neighbor, and he will not relent. He will not give up until the neighbor responds. This is what persistent prayer looks like, is we seek the one who can meet the need until in due time and according to his will, he does so. But here in this prayer, Paul begins not first with the need, but he begins first by emphasizing the need that has already been met in our own lives. It's what has been provided to us, and it's the work of redemption and the atoning work of Christ that we have benefited from. It's the gospel itself. Because Paul says here, be devoted in prayer, keeping alert or being watchful with thanksgiving. For what are we to be thankful for? It is the gospel itself that we have first received it our need has been provided for. And we know this is in Paul's mind because in chapter 1, verse 12, he writes there with regard to his prayer for the church in Colossae. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so it is with a constant, steadfast, persistent focus, first with gratitude on the work Christ has graciously ap applied to us, then the urgency of our prayers turn to the intercession for the sake of others to also know him. And so it is the case that as we consider praying for the sake of the gospel, it begins with recognizing that we now delight in Christ. You can't pray for others to come to faith in Christ without first considering how the gospel has come to you and transformed your life and become the foundation of your hope and your life. And so even though you come to pray for others, you have to recognize for God, what have you done for me? And I praise you and I thank you and I rejoice in you and I celebrate with gratitude this wonderful, wonderful work of the gospel. That's the first opportunity. Gospel-centered prayer provides for us. The second is an opportunity to declare Christ. Gospel-centered prayer requests the opportunity to declare Christ. We see this in verses 3 through 4. Paul continues then on, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open, open to us a door for the word. A door for the word that we may speak the mystery of Christ. Now let's look at this carefully. Paul says, pray for us that God may open up us a door for the word. The idea here is that God is the one who must open the door. Now friends, this is an affirmation of the doctrine of predestination. 
It's a recognition that God has set his call on certain individuals. We don't know who they are. But it's not us who opens up the door. It's not us who initiates the work of the gospel. It's God who initiates it. If you were to go to Ephesians chapter 1, it begins by saying in the rehearsal of all that God has done through the gospel for us, God chose. God predestined. And so what we do is we come in prayer on behalf of the lost. We recognize, God, you begin the work. This is God's sovereignty in evangelism. Yes, there's man's responsibility, but it's a recognition that God must open up the door. See, God must begin the work of regeneration in the heart through his Holy Spirit. He must gift faith. So when the message is proclaimed, there is a response. And though it appears that it's the human response, it is God who has begun that work through the opening of the door of their heart. And so it is God who has called individuals to himself, and therefore any effort at evangelism must begin with a recognition and request that God prepares the heart. He prepares the time, and he even prepares the occasion for one to respond to the gospel message. And this is Paul's repeated testimony in his entire missionary experience. Listen, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8-9, through 9, Paul writes, I shall remain in Ephesus until the time of Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me. And the recognition there in the term is it's, it's passive. He didn't open the door. It's recognizing God opened up the door. He repeats the same statement in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, where he states, a wide door has opened, for, opened to me to go to Troas. Who opened the door? God opened the door. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, at the close of Paul's first missionary journey, he and Barnabas could say together all things that God had with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. See, one of the reasons we're anxious about evangelism is we don't trust our own ability to persuade or win people to Christ. When you recognize it's God who opens up the door, the burden and pressure is not on you to be persuasive of speech or to be influential or to be so clear and dynamic in your expression of the gospel that somehow you've convinced man that the message is correct. It's God who convinces man that this is the truth. See, so your task is simply to proclaim Christ and then to demonstrate him. Well, once the door is opened, of course, Paul notes here that the door must be opened then for what? The word. The word. And this is an affirmation that our evangelism methodology must not be driven by slick marketing strategies, pragmatic programs, or even charismatic personalities. It is God's word alone which the Spirit uses to convict hearts. And this should be an encouragement to each of us that the gospel effect is not contingent upon our own persuasive efforts, but God himself. And so to be an ambassador, to be a witness, we must wield the sword of the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, even young adults and teenagers, you're in a faithful Bible-teaching church. You know the word. Don't doubt its power in the hands of God. Proclaim it. Declare it. And that's what Paul goes on to say. It's the word that we speak forth and declare. It's the proclamation of the message of Christ that is necessary for effective evangelism. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 16. I want you to see how Paul treats this in this text. As he closes out this amazing letter to the church at Rome where he has brought such clarity to Christ as the new covenant and as the fulfillment of the law and has, holds forth such great doctrinal truths. He closes this text 
with an affirmation of what we see in Colossians chapter 4, verse 25 of chapter 16. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. And Paul is saying to us that ours is a word-based ministry that we're to declare, and precisely the focus of our message is an explanation of who Christ is. He uses the phrase, the mystery of Christ. It's a term that is used frequently in his writings, and the term mystery is used multiple times to explain the truth, which has been hidden until this time, where the fullness of the scriptures have come and is now being revealed to those who are called by God. In Colossians 2, verses 2 through 3, the term he uses there is the mystery of the incarnate God. It's the same idea that John states in John chapter 1, verse 18, where he says, No man has ever seen the Father, but Christ who took on flesh revealed the Father to man. He makes known. See, a mystery is something that you can't comprehend or understand until somebody explains. But once explained, it becomes clear. And what he's saying is, we have a message that can answer the mystery in the minds and hearts of the lost about who Christ truly is and what he came to do and what he can accomplish on our behalf. Now, Paul says, in being a good steward of this message, he says, I've even been imprisoned. And it was for the sake of the gospel that Paul had been imprisoned. But it was while he was in prison that he both wrote four New Testament epistles, as well as testified of Christ to kings, governors, guards, and even the household of Caesar. See, it didn't matter his circumstances. Paul knew he was on point with one responsibility. You know, sometimes the Lord sets us in difficult circumstances. I had the occasion years ago to preach in the middle of a prison in the country of Uganda. And I knew that there were many men there who, because they couldn't afford an attorney, they had been falsely accused, and they were incarcerated, really, unfairly. They weren't guilty of their crimes. Many, of course, were guilty. And I said to them, listen, it doesn't matter your circumstances that brought you here. You're here. And you are imprisoned, okay? But I want you to know it may be for this very reason to hear the message of the gospel that you might not have heard in your normal life circumstances. Recently, I had the opportunity to observe my mother-in-law She and my father-in-law had the privilege of serving here in South Africa for a number of years. Their heart is still here. Uh, They love the people of South Africa. But they're quite elderly now and have many health issues. And she um, had suffered a fall and and, uh, had injured herself and was in the hospital. And she found herself there for actually three and a half weeks. It was a delayed stay. And as my wife would go visit her, every day, and I'd have the opportunity to see her. I'd say, how are you doing, Mom? And she'd say, you know what? It's been a good day. I said, well, why is it a good day? I know you're in pain and you're suffering. She says, because I got to talk to my nurse about Christ. Or I got to talk to my neighbor. Or I got to pray with my roommate. And here's my 85-year-old mother-in-law who understands exactly what Paul's saying. It doesn't matter your circumstances or your suffering. God set you there to be a testimony for him. And she said, you know, I was finding, because she's more housebound these days, and as a a long-term missionary, you know, who had spent her life involved in ministry, she found herself being housebound and was struggling with not feeling as useful to the Lord for the sake of the gospel. And she said, I was praying that the Lord would open up a door for me to just be useful 
And when I was sent to the hospital, I understood that was his answer to my prayer. Boy, I learned a lot from my mother-in-law. But what I learned from her is just the living example of this wonderful principle in Scripture. No matter where God sets you, even in response to preaching the gospel, and you may suffer persecution and hardship, he goes on to say that my task is to make it clear in the way I ought to speak or to give a solemn testimony of the gospel. And so Paul goes on next to state then what the response to such a prayer is. And the third opportunity we see of gospel-centered prayer is that it results in the opportunity to demonstrate Christ. To demonstrate Christ, verse 5 tells us that we're to conduct ourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Or the English Standard Version puts it this way, to walk in wisdom. Now this is a phrase that Paul likes to use in his writings. Characterizing the Christian life as a faithful walk. He says in Galatians 5, of course, to walk in the Spirit, bearing fruit of godliness. Or in Ephesians chapter 5, he talks about walking in the light. Or in Philippians 1 or Ephesians 4, he speaks of walking in a manner that's consistent with or worthy of the gospel. And what it means to walk worthy means not deserving of the gospel. That's impossible. It means you walk in a manner that's consistent with the gospel message. See, if you're going to preach a gospel of love and mercy and justice and forgiveness and reconciliation and peace, then we need to demonstrate those things in our daily lives. We need to illustrate the gospel principles by showing the fruit of the Spirit in practice. Is that not what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those aren't just feelings that you have. It's, it's what's necessary in living in the context of being in relationships with fallen human beings. You demonstrate the heart of God in those relationships, and that's the fruit of the Spirit and the work of God in us to bear such fruit so that as we then go to proclaim a message of love and mercy and justice and forgiveness, our lives are like small little parables. Christ loved parables, didn't he? He said, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he'd point to a farmer sowing seed. See, they understood that picture. That made sense to them. They saw that on a daily basis. And then he would say, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Christ was a great teacher using illustrations and parables. And the idea that we see in Scripture is as we imitate Christ, as we follow his example or we walk in a manner consistent with or worthy of the gospel itself, our lives are like living parables. And so now the understanding is if you're going to pray, pray with an affirmation that you've been saved and you're thankful for the redemption that you enjoy, and then you're going to pray that God opens up the doors for others to know him. Paul understands what comes next. It is the need then to live in a way where your life is like a living parable illustrating the gospel message. Now you fall short of that, don't you? And I do too. But this is helpful to us in our pursuit of sanctification because we understand our sanctification is not ultimately just for our own good and our own benefit. The fact of the matter is, if we're not sanctified and living godly and holy lives, we may very well undermine our gospel message. And so the call to the church is just not for your good, it's for the good of the lost. And brothers and sisters, if you can't reconcile your conflict when there's a minor offense, compared to your offense towards a holy God that he was willing to forgive you for? And I speak to myself, shame on us. Because our neighbor knows. They hear about the battles and the concerns within the church. Yes, we want to pursue reconciliation and peace for our own benefit, but ultimately that's not the greater purpose. The greater purpose is that the church as a whole shines as a bright light. And they see the power of the gospel to transform individuals to be like Jesus Christ. And it can give the lost not only a picture, but a confidence that what's being extended to them is true. 
And so Paul says we're to conduct ourselves in this way towards outsiders. We're to demonstrate towards them what gospel living looks like. This is Paul's point in 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 12, he says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, or the lost, so that they, as a result of your good deeds, and good deeds are simply just living out godliness in daily life, they may, as a result of your good deeds, come to glorify God in the day of visitation. Your testimony matters. Our testimony matters. Turn with me to Romans 13, where we see this principle again. Verses 11 through 14, read with me. He says, do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep. For, sal- for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, but in strife not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Oh, if we had the time, we go from text to text to text that reminds us that our opportunity is to live Christ. To live Christ, and that's what Paul's praying for. He goes on then in our last opportunity of a gospel-centered prayer is found in verse 6. He says, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Lastly, a gospel-centered prayer anticipates an opportunity to defend Christ. To defend Christ. What does it mean here? to speak in such a way that it is always gracious. Well, Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give what? Grace to those who hear. Of course, Paul confronts the use of our tongue does it in James chapter 3 and verses 9 through 12. It can be an instrument for good or an instrument for harm. And if you think about the idea of grace itself, certainly it means that grace is the extension of that which is undeserved. And so sometimes, even in the ministry of the gospel, we're met with unkindness, hostility, Argument, disagreement, criticism. But if our ministry and our life is to be one of extending a message of grace, our speech must also be characterized by grace so that we meet unkind words with kindness. And this is true in evangelism especially. So that when we're attacked or criticized or falsely accused, we don't respond in an argumentative self-defensive, or even a self-promoting manner. How can we? When the reality is we are actually much worse sinners than they even accuse us of being. We know our state. But here there's another emphasis of grace. Paul says we are always to be prepared to speak the message of grace. And this is defending and explaining the gracious work of Jesus Christ. And this is the gospel message. Now he says if we speak this way, in a gracious manner, with the message of grace, that our speech will be like the use of salt, which purifies and seasons. And it is the case that believer's speech in the message of the gospel should have a purifying effect. We know this is the work of salt, to purify and to counteract the effects of corruption. And in a general sense, Christians are instructed that their speech should be kind, of course, and gentle and sensitive and truthful. But in this greater sense, there is no 
more significant purifying effect that our speech can have than to apply the truth about Christ to the impurity of sin. And that's why Christ can claim in Matthew chapter 5, 16 that our lives as a testimony for Christ can function as the salt of the earth. Now Paul continues here with a purpose statement saying, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. And the word response here is simply the word for answer. People have questions, especially people in crisis. People in crisis ask eternal questions. Is there really a God? What happens to me when I die? See, it's in those points of crisis that we need to be present to answer their questions. It's when people are in crisis, the church should move towards them, not away from them. And prepare to give an answer to their questions. And the word answer or respond in Greek is apokrinistai. And what that means is to give a rationale or an explanation that results in a judicial sentence and a discerning answer or conclusion being made. See, a judge weighs all the facts, doesn't he? And his task is to discern through all the claims, look at the merits of the case and what the facts are, and draw the correct conclusion. And that's what Paul's saying here. As we come to defend Christ and we give an explanation and an answer to man's questions with the truth, they should be able, of course, in his strength and in his spirit, to draw the right conclusion. They are desperately in need of a redeemer. And Christ is that redeemer. This reminds us of what Paul writes in 1 Peter chapter 3. You can turn there with me. Chapter 3, verse 15 through verse 18, we read this. Peter writes, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet, with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Here be Paul uses a term that we derive the word apology from, apologia. And from this term, we get the word apologetics, which means making a defense for the gospel. And the word here exactly means the picture of a courtroom where a defense lawyer presents arguments which prove the claims of the defendant and results in a verdict by the judge or jury which is correct. And so in evangelism, we use the gospel in an apologetic fashion, giving a clear argument that corrects false religions, false gospels, false worldviews, so that the right conclusion can justly be made. And so the book of Colossians is about the reality of knowing and imitating and proclaiming Christ. It's one who trusts and obeys Christ who is steadfastly focused and devoted to seeing others come to know their beloved Lord. And therefore, with a heart of gratitude, we pray for opportunities to delight, to declare, to demonstrate, and give a defense of him, Jesus Christ. And so we see in this brief text, Paul's affirmation, yes, of human responsibility, but more significantly, divine sovereignty in the work to win the lost. I don't know what doors the Lord will open for you, which ones that you need for him to open. But as you go out into his harvest fields, whatever doors they are, be sure that prayer is the key. It's the key that will unlock the message of the gospel in the hearts of men and women. And those who've gone before, whose hearts were as committed and as zealous as you may be today, eventually had to learn this lesson in their own evangelism and missionary experiences. Let me note just two as we close. Samuel Zwemer, who was the missionary nicknamed the Apostle to Islam. He summed it up in saying it this way. The history of missions is the history of answered prayer. 
it is the key to the whole missions problem. And I appreciate this statement by a gentleman named Stephen Gock Kroger. He said, prayer needs no passport, no visa, and no work permit. There is no such thing as a closed country to God as far as prayer is concerned. And much of the history of missions could be written in terms of God moving in response to persistent prayer. And so I offer to you this charge from the Apostle Paul that we may be more devoted in prayer, in gospel ministry. And the Lord will use us in his timing, in our places of impact, and bring glory to himself. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, we come to you now in prayer. And of course, we have to praise you and thank you for your own redemption affected and worked out in our own lives. We've sung this morning and we've celebrated this wonderful meal of remembrance of this very work on our behalf. And so we praise you. We honor you today. We thank you that our hope is secure. Eternity has been settled for us. We will abide in your presence forever. No matter what we suffer in this world, no, nothing can separate us from your love. And so we are free to face hostility, persecution, rejection. And yet, Lord, we are weak. And our text this morning reminds us that we're to come to you on our knees and to rely on you to bring to faith those we love and those we know and that those that we need to pursue. And so, Lord, we pray now that you would be at work in such a way to, yes, make us prayers, but also open up doors for further advancement of the gospel in Polokwane and beyond its borders, beyond the borders of South Africa to neighboring nations, and even beyond. And, Lord, may we begin to see you do that in our schools, in our workplaces, in our gymnasiums, in our grocery stores, as we interface with the lost. And then, Lord, help us to be good students of your word that we might be prepared to give a clear and accurate explanation of who Christ is. So make us good students, we ask. And may all these things accomplished under your sovereign purpose have the ultimate effect that Christ is honored and glorified. And we pray this in his beloved and precious name. Amen.